I read. All right, so the last five weeks, we have been studying Christ's earthly ministry. We have been looking at these five aspects of his earthly ministry and how all Christians are to be replicating these ministries. Do you remember, Phoenix, what those five ministries are? Uh, baptism. No. Oh, man. That's right. <laughs> Deliverance, healing. Yes, yes. Um, evangelism. Yes. Really that's, that's all right. You're doing you're doing good. You weren't here for most of this week, so that's oh, okay, fine. Cool. <laughs> so the five earthly ministries of Jesus are evangelism. He went preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He, he taught the scripture. He went into the synagogues and he taught the scripture teaching. He discipled. He called disciples unto himself. He healed the sick and he cast out demons. So these are the five earthly ministries of Jesus. And these are the core capacities of every Christian. And these are to be the fundamental aspects of our Christian. Now, over the last five weeks, we've looked at each of these ministries individually. If you're watching online, I would suggest going back and watching those videos if you have any questions about them. But basically, we prove from the scripture that each of these are the responsibility of every Christian in some capacity or another. So, now that we've covered Christ's earthly ministry, we're going to look at something that is going to help us perform that ministry. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a divine enablement which takes place after conversion. It is an empowering of the Holy Spirit to be able to do the work of ministry. Now, over the last 1900 years in church history, there's been a lot of people who saw it in the scripture, especially during the first and second great awakenings. These great men of God, they saw it, they saw the word, they didn't understand what it meant. They were searching after it, they were seeking after it, and finally, at the Azusa Street Revival, the baptism of the Holy Spirit became mainstream in the church. And it was an empowering to be able uh, to enable us to do the work of the ministry. So, now, in Pentecostal and Charismatic circles today, um, we understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what enables us to do supernatural ministry. We think of it as is what enables us to speak in tongues, it's what enables us to prophesy, heal the sick, and to a certain degree that's true, but that's not all it is. The first thing I'd like to point out is if we look back at the five weeks prior, the disciples during the earthly ministry of Jesus cast out demons and healed the sick, yes? yes. But they were not baptized in the Holy Spirit until after Pentecost. So deliverance and healing are possible without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If we look further, there are people throughout church history, the Puritans, Cotton Mathers, John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, that were not baptized in the Holy Spirit, but they did cast out demons and heal the sick. Wynne Worley did his deliverance ministry for a whole year before he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. But when the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes, it makes healing and deliverance easier. It enables us to do it with more power to bring to bear. For example, Cotton Mathers, who was alive during the 1600s, he cast out demons. But when they wanted to cast out demons, it would take several days of prayer and fasting and rebuking to be able to get somebody delivered from demons. And now today, when we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we see that it goes much quicker than that. So there's an enablement that makes healing and deliverance easier and more effective. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit does more than just make the healing and deliverance better. I think I'm going to wait for that fire truck to go by. So you want to do a prayer real quick? What's that? So do you want to do a prayer real quick? this? Yeah, uh, is it a fire truck or an ambulance? I think it's fire. Okay, well, Father, whatever it is right now, we just lift up the people. We ask that you would heal anybody who's sick or injured in Jesus' name, that you would give courage and, uh, and grace to the firefighters and the ambulance drivers, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to do what they need to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, the baptism of the Holy Spirit does more than just enable healing and deliverance. It enhances all of the gifts and the ministries of Jesus. And it gives us something that we haven't looked at yet called the gifts of the Spirit, which we'll be exploring in subsequent weeks. The gifts of the Spirit are accessories to the main ministries of Jesus. That means that prophecy, gifts of healing, gifts of faith, these things are to support and uphold and edify the primary ministries of Jesus. They don't replace them. They are not on equal footing with them. The primary ministries of Jesus are the primary ministries of every Christian, but all the gifts of the Spirit build up, edify, and make more potent those primary ministries. Does that make sense? Yes. Awesome. 
So we are going to look at that today. Let's go to, um, like I said, Acts chapter 1. I'm going to look at verses 4 and 4 through 8 here. So, verse 4, And Jesus was here, and he said, Being assembled with them, he, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they came together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now, what he's talking about here is they thought this was the eschatological restoration of Israel. Their minds were in the wrong place. But Jesus describes the baptism, saying, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We notice first thing here is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for kicks and giggles. It's not so we can have a, a nice little charismatic circus. It's so that you may be my witnesses into the ends of the world. How do we witness to Jesus? We evangelize, we disciple, we cast our demons, we heal the sick. The primary ministries of Jesus... Bless them, Father, in Jesus' name. The primary ministries of Jesus are how we witness of Christ into the ends of the world. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for the purpose to enable the disciples to do that. Second thing we notice, he said, wait in Jerusalem. He said, do not go and try to be my witnesses until you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now we remember, the apostles had already cast out demons. They were already preaching. They were already healing the sick while Jesus was on the earth. But they had him as a guide. So they said, do not go until you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. They had the ability to preach. They had the ability to cast out demons and heal the sick. But he said, do not go until you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe because of that, there shouldn't be people going into full-time ministry without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We shouldn't be going out and witnessing and doing all these things without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, people do that and they see some success, just like we said, when Worley cast out demons for quite a while before he was baptized in the Holy Ghost. But Jesus says to the apostles to wait. So let's go on here and let's see what he is talking about. Now, let's go over to uh, Acts chapter 2. This is when it happens. I'm going to start in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, a rushing mighty wind that filled the entire house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, which sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because, notice very closely here, because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. Now, this is often read, we think, okay, so this big group of people, one of them was speaking this language, one of them was speaking that language. No, what it says here in the syntax, if you notice very closely, is each person heard all of them speaking in his own language, meaning they were speaking in a heavenly tongue and each one was hearing his own earthly language as they were, as they were, um, as they were speaking in tongues. Each one was hearing it in his own language. The supernatural enablement was in them to be able to interpret the tongues and hear the glory of God. And that was for the result of the subsequent altar call that Peter gives later in this chapter. Now, let's just look real quick. At the end of Peter's altar call, he explains what's happening. And we're gonna jump down to verse, let's see here, verse 37. And he says, Now when they heard this, that is Peter's sermon, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? And Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises to you and your children, all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, some people take this and they use this as the single proof text 
for baptismal regeneration because Peter is linking salvation to baptism. I don't buy that because later in Acts chapter 3, Peter gives another altar call and he only links it to repentance. However, what we see here is there is a formula. Everyone who wants to get right with God should repent, they should be baptized in water, and they should receive the Holy Spirit. That means that this is not some special dispensation for the apostles. All the people who Peter was preaching to were to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit for? You notice, the first thing is there is a manifestation that comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What is that? Tongues. They all spoke in tongues. Now, we know praying in tongues today, and there is a general debate between Charismatics and Pentecostals, and the Pentecostals say that the only evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues, and Charismatic people say, well, there's a lot of different evidences of the baptism in tongues is just one of them. My understanding, if you look at the scripture, every example we're going to look at today, they were speaking in tongues. So that seems to be at least the primary evidence. Now, I suppose it's possible for somebody to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit without speaking in tongues right then and there. However, I would say the rule, with maybe some exceptions, is that tongues is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So, what, turn over here. Now, what is a few things we want to notice about the baptism? It's for three basic purposes. Now, we notice the tongues is part of the charismatic gifts and is followed by the other charismatic gifts, prophecy, uh, you know, words of knowledge, discernment of spirits and all that. Now, that's one, and those charismatic gifts help us to do all the major ministries of Jesus. Tongues, specifically, we're going to look at a little bit later, but there's another thing. The baptism of the Holy Spirit didn't just give them tongues. There was a character change. Now, I'm not going to turn there, but if you look at chapter 3, when they're arrested by the Sanhedrin, you'll see that the Sanhedrin were astounded by how bold these uneducated men were speaking publicly. We remember that back in the Gospels, they were locking themselves in corners because they were afraid of the people who crucified Jesus. Now, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, and they were filled with boldness. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just about charismatic gifts and speaking in tongues and falling over. That often happens, but it created a new character in the recipients of the baptism. It created a character of boldness. They couldn't contain it. Jeremiah said it this way. He said that I can't contain the word of God within me. I have to speak it out. It's like a fire in my bones. That's what happened to the disciples. They got whipped and lacerated and rebuked, but they kept preaching because the baptism of the Holy Spirit was changing their nature on the inside. And that is what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does for us today. There is a change of nature. And I would argue, even if a person speaks in tongues and displays certain evidences of charismatic gifts, that if there is not a major character change in their life, then they probably have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right. The third thing the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for, is like I mentioned previously, is that it enables us to better disciple, better evangelize, better cast out demons, better heal the sick. I think we could care a uh, cotton matters, for example, I said. He, it took him several days to cast demons out of somebody because he was not baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now today, it, at worst, it takes us several hours, but more like a number of minutes to an hour we can get demons out of a person. Why? Because we have a power that Cotton Mathers didn't tap into. We have a power that John Wesley didn't tap into. We have a power that Martin Luther didn't tap into. Now, if you didn't know, all those people operated in power. They healed the sick. They cast out demons. But they didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they were not able to do them as effectively as we are today. So the baptism gives us more power to be able to perform the ministries of Jesus. All right, let's look at another example in the book of Acts. If you will turn with me to Acts chapter 8. This is the second example in Acts of the baptism. All right. And verse 1. No, no, no. Excuse me, verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered because of the persecution in the preceding verses went everywhere preaching the word. Now... The church was persecuted. They're coming out, they're killing everyone, throwing them in jail. But because these people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they went out with boldness preaching the word. Now, Philip, for one example, went down to the city of Samaria. He preached Christ. The multitudes with one accord, he did the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits 
crying out with loud voices came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Now, we're going to skip down. What's happening is there's a revival in Samaria, right? Amen. People are getting saved. People are getting healed. People are getting baptized. People are getting delivered. Now, Simon, or not, excuse me, Philip calls the apostles to come and see the revival. Now, let's go see this in verse 14. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them, that is the new believers, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet, he had not fallen on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they, the apostles, laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that through the laying on of hands of the apostles that the Holy Spirit was given, he offered the money. Now, this may be familiar to you. Simon saw something. The scripture doesn't tell us what exactly he saw, but if we look at all the other examples in Acts, they probably spoke in tongues. And maybe they fell over, I don't know. But they spoke in tongues at least. And Simon saw this and offered the apostles money. So what happened? The apostles came. There's healing. These people were being delivered. They were being healed of paralysis. They were baptized in the name of the Lord. They had repented. They were forming a church. There was a high caliber revival happening in Samaria. But the apostles came and they saw that the revival was not complete. It was missing something. It was missing the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which would enable these Christians to live successful Christian lives in this city full of witchcraft. So when we are leading people to the Lord, what does that mean? When we're leading people to the Lord, bringing them to repentance and even baptizing them in water is not enough. We need to bring the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why when we see in San Diego, when TK goes on the streets, when they lead people to the Lord, 99% of the time they get baptized in the Holy Spirit within a few minutes of them accepting Christ. That is, is a fantastic. That is a fantastic display of power because from day one, they don't have to be a Christian without that powerful enablement they are given the baptism of the holy spirit that they can say like paul that your faith will not rest on human wisdom i.e i'm not going to use apologetics and convince you of the legitimacy of christ there's a place for that but paul says that your faith will not rest on human wisdom but on the power of god if they receive the baptism of the holy spirit they feel the evidence they speak in tongues they feel the transformation, their characters change, they can say, I, my faith does not rest on words, it doesn't rest because someone prayed for me and told me the gospel, it rests because the Holy Spirit touched me, I felt the power and my life change for the better when I accepted Christ and received the Holy Spirit. Amen? So the baptism of the Holy Spirit should be a part of our evangelistic endeavor, not just something that we do at altar calls, not just something we offer to Christians. If we lead somebody to the Lord, we should get them baptized in the Holy Spirit as soon as possible. Amen? Amen. All right, oh, man, it's already going. Now, let's uh, go over to our third example in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Acts 10, verse 34. All right. Now, what's happening here is Peter is at the house of a Roman centurion. This Roman had a vision and an angel told him to call Peter to his house. So Peter came, and the Roman centurion doesn't know what happened. Now, Peter preaches the gospel, and this is what happened. Now, now uh, in verse 34, if you just glance through this, this is Peter's preaching the gospel to him. He's explaining the word of God. He's explaining what happened. And I'm going to jump down to verse 44. While he is still preaching, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished because as many came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Gentiles. Well, uh, Peter, how did you know that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit? Because they had some sort of inward character change? No. Because they heard them speaking in tongues and magnifying God. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Now, to me, that is a proof text that, you know, kind of debunks baptismal regeneration because these people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit before they were baptized in water. Well, 
just some truth of the law. That's not what the sermon is on today. But we see that these people, Romans, Gentiles, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in tongues. Amen? Amen. That's right. Now, they were baptized in water right after that. Now, that tells me, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, Peter didn't say, Look, great, look at them. Now they can join the church. Hallelujah, look at them. No. For them to join the church, for them to be welcomed into the fellowship, his immediate thought was that they be baptized in water. We'll notice throughout all of Acts that repentance, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and baptism of water are all linked. They go together. There's an urgency. There's not a, okay, well, you know, we got them saved. Now let's put them through a class, and after six months, and they can get baptized, and then uh, we'll just kind of keep it a secret, and then after they're a Christian for 10 years, we'll let them know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then maybe they'll figure it out. No, that's not what happens. They don't keep it a secret. Boom, right after one another. You repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. That is what the book of Acts says. That's what we should be doing today. We shouldn't be withholding one of these things from somebody because of some uh, religious tradition that we have. Amen? Amen? All right. Let's look at our final example of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. We're going to go over to Acts chapter 19 in verse 1. Acts 19... Uh, all right now Paul here is at Ephesus all right and it happened well Apollos was at Corinth that Paul having passed through the upper regions came to Ephesus and finding some disciples now that means he found some Christians there now this tells me uh, okay I'm gonna hold that thought and he said to them did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed they said to him we have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that funny? So these Christians were baptized, and they were they believed they were repented, they were real Christians, but they had not been baptized in the Holy Spirit for a period of perhaps years. Now, this is a text that shows us that you certainly can be a born-again Christian without having the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, verse 3, he said to them, Into what were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. So Paul said, John indeed baptized a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So John's baptism was not a replacement for Christian baptism, right? Not that we're probably going to run into anybody who was baptized by John today. <laughs> now, when Paul laid hands on them, okay, so they believed years prior, they were baptized with two water baptisms, okay? And then, when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and what happened? I have a question. Yes. So you're saying that they believed before they knew, they believed in the Messiah before the Messiah came to their knowledge, so they are saved before... The, okay, so hang on, I, no. So what's happening is, this is, this is decades after the resurrection of Christ, okay? So Paul comes into the city and he finds a group of Christians there who are Christians already. And these Christians had not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? And the Holy Spirit had baptized in the name of Christ. Not, neither. They hadn't received Christian baptism. But they were saved. But they were saved and they were Christians. They believed in Christ. They were here. This is after Christ had been resurrected. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So. You threw me off my outline a little bit there. Okay. So they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. What happened? Then they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Again, this is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what happened? Now, they're speaking tongues in verse 7. Now, they just all get together, throw off a circus tent, and just, you know, hop around and sing kumbaya and speak in tongues together. Is that what they did? No, that's not what they did. Verse 8. And he, Paul, went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when they were hardened, the Jews, and did not believe, they spoke evil of the way that is Christianity before the multitude. He departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrenus. Now they went out and they were reasoning among the Gentiles, so they were witnessing, okay? And what was the result? This continued for two years, so that the entire province of Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. They went throughout the entire area of what is modern day Turkey and brought the gospel to everybody. That's what it says. And that was the result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit should bring about an urge for witness. It should bring about an urge for evangelism so that we can preach the gospel. 
And that was the result when these people were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Ten people. Ten people. And look at what happened. They brought the gospel to that entire area, which is the size of a country today. Amen? Well, now before we wrap up, let's just talk about tongues real quick. Now, tongues is not synonymous with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but you must be baptized in the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues. And if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will speak in tongues. Does that make sense? But it isn't exactly the same thing. So we're going to talk about tongues for a little bit because a lot of people have some confusion. So if you want to uh, jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to try to clear up that confusion real quick. Now, if you don't know, the confusion I'm talking about is um, many Christians are confused. And they say tongues may exist, but it's for evangelism, i.e. that I'm supposed to miraculously learn a language and then go to another country so I can witness to these people. Now they base that off of Acts chapter 2. If you remember looking at the syntax of Acts chapter 2, that's not what happened. The individuals hearing it miraculously got the gift of interpretation and were able to interpret it in their own language, not the apostles speaking it in diverse languages. Does that make sense? Now, they say, oh, this is for you to go out and, you know, do all this. Well, of course, that never happens, so they say, of course, tongues must not exist then. Um, and this is uh, really, I, I question this, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me because that's not what the Bible says. Let's look at what the Bible says. Now, concerning the spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, unfortunately, a lot of churches do want us to be ignorant. There's a lot of churches that do believe in the spiritual gifts, and they think that, you you know, we'll just keep them in the dark, we don't want to talk about it, and then maybe after they're saved for 25 years, we'll like, hey, you know, tongues, and then run away. It, no, that's not that's not how it should be. Paul didn't want his people to be ignorant, so we shouldn't be want our people to be ignorant either, amen? You know that when you were Gentiles, you were carried away by dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that nobody speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Let me expand upon that. What he's talking about is prophecy. So if someone belts off a prophecy and it is contrary to Scripture, they are not speaking by the Spirit of God. They're speaking by another spirit. He's linking to the dumb idols, which elsewhere he says are demons. So there's a demon spirit that can belt off prophecy just as well as the Holy Spirit can, right? So doctrine will not be affected by prophecy. Doctrine is affected by the Word of God. So he says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Differences in ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but the same God who works in them all. But the manifestation is given to each for the profit of all. To no one, to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Another, gift of healing through the same Spirit. Another, working of miracles. Another, prophecy. Another, discerning of spirits. Another, different types of tongues. Okay, there's our tongues. To another, interpretation of text. So this is the list of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Those aren't the only ones. Those are the ones that Paul lists here. Now... With that in mind, let's turn over to chapter 14, real quick. All right, you know, I, I put your finger in chapter 14, but I will just, I want to briefly go over those gifts, all right? So we had the power gifts as healing, faith, miracles, okay? So what's the difference between healing and miracles? First of all, a gift of healing doesn't mean that only that person can pray for the sick. It just means that that person will have an accelerated version of what every Christian can operate in healing. Miracles are things that are above and beyond regular healings, like I can pray for somebody's cold and they can be healed, or I can see somebody's arm pop out of its socket after it got chopped off. The second would be the working of miracles. A gift of faith is an enablement for us to be able to believe for the things we pray for. For example, one time I prayed for my car radio and it got miraculously healed. That is a gift of faith. Now we have the utterance gifts, tongues, interpretation, prophecy. Prophecy is an utterance from God. Tongues is also an utterance from God, but it's in a heavenly language that we don't understand. Interpretation of tongues is an utterance that interprets the tongues. Does that make sense? And then we have discernment. You just lost my train of thought there. We have discernment. Help me out, Andy. What are the other ones? Discernment, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Okay. Words of knowledge and wisdom are words that are given to us by the Holy Spirit in our minds, and discernment of spirits is the ability to be able to distinguish between different spirits. 
All right, so with that covered, we are going to cover those in other weeks and in Bible studies. Let's look at tongues again. Verse, or chapter 14, verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For him who speaks in the tongue speaks to men. Oh, wait, what? No, does not speak to men. Therefore, tongues isn't for you to go and, and evangelize, unlike what some people say. He who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for nobody understands him. What? He who speaks in a tongue, nobody understands him? I, John MacArthur, I thought that it was for evangelism. No! He who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but speaks to God, for nobody understands him. However, he speaks mysteries in the Spirit. He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. So prophecy is for people. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you prophesy. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues, unless he indeed interprets it, that the church may be edified. Tongues is for your prayer closet for you to be edified, to be able to grow in a closer relationship with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now, that's right, Green. Tell him. In verse 18, what does Paul say? That's interesting. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. But I would rather speak five words in an assembly than a thousand words in tongues. Now, some people say this to me. Oh, well, you know, look, you can't speak in tongues in the church. You have to keep it in your prayer closet. Eh, wrong. You can speak in tongues in the church. Fine. When you're praying, when there's a prayer meeting, when there's worship, when there's time where you're spending time with the Lord, that is when you speak in tongues. Now, what he's referring to is if I'm up here preaching, I'm not going to get up and go, Kandarabao, Korobobo Show, Korobobo Harababo. What does that stand for? That is not what tongues is for because nobody understands it. It's for God. So when you get up in a pulpit, you're not just supposed to belt off in tongues for 20 minutes and say, amen, and get down. That's not what it's for. It's for spending time with God. Now, if you're spending time with God in a corporate setting, through a prayer meeting, through worship, then that is absolutely acceptable. But Paul's saying it is better when you're in a pulpit speaking before other people, not speaking to God, but speaking to men, that you speak intelligently. You teach, preach, exhort, prophesy, something that people can understand and be built up by. Amen? So, does everyone think we have a kind of a good grasp on tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit? All right. Amen. Well, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the water of life. It's for us not to keep to ourselves, not to enjoy spiritual gifts and feel important, but it's for us to be able to reach the world and build up other people. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Well, 